very delicate stage of the proceedings. Honestly, Todd, you probably don't have any conception of oh, the skill it takes to master rigging. I think you'd probably be right. Well, it, it, it's a very rare talent. You've got to have the uh, delicate forensic hand-eye coordination of, well, a heart surgeon. Oh, come on, Brian. It's hardly the same. Oh, it really is. It really isn't. Look, um, how about pizza, George? It's got... Two biggins for 20 quid on it. Oh, you know how to spoil a man, Tudicles. The talk of the street. 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 Welcome to episode 252 of the Talk of the Street, an unofficial Coronation Street catch-up podcast that pledges allegiance to the band of Mr. Schneebly and will not fight him for creative control and will defer to him on all issues related to the musical direction of the band. I'm Gavin. My pants keep falling down. (laughs) And not for fun reasons either. Well, they're funny reasons. Yes, diabetes is hilarious. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because it's the diabetes that's made me lose weight. So thanks, diabetes. (laughs) It's so funny, though, diabetes. (laughs) Diabetes. Hilarious. Well, just think how Brett Michaels is feeling right now. (laughs) I was about ready to mention him. (laughs) Because he is funny. He is funny. Not on purpose. Yeah. Does it matter? No, not it really. really. Doesn't. It really doesn't. So, while your pants are in the up position, yes. How are you this week, Helen? I'm good. I'm good. The man cave auction is done. It oh, should be hold going. On. <laughs> auction talk. <laughs> okay, you may proceed. Yeah, the, the Man Cave auction is, is done and should be going live either tonight or tomorrow. I'm very, very excited. I think it looks really good. There there was some tweaking that was done by my boss. So it doesn't look as, as pretty as I wanted it to be. Um, there are, Your boss made it less pretty? Well, he wanted me to move more of the advertising signs up on the first page. And so, and so I did, and it, the the colors don't flow as nicely as I had them because of that. But it still looks really nice and good, and I'm very proud of it. And it's so nice to have a job that's like creatively fulfilling. Mm-hmm. In Are this, you just showing off now. In this manner, <laughs> spreadsheets can be creatively fulfilling. Helen, I haven't dabbled in spreadsheets <laughs> for literally years. I know, but it's funny to just say my husband does spreadsheets for a mm. living. Yeah, almost as funny as diabetes. <laughs> almost. almost. Nothing beats diabetes. Yeah, so I'm I'm really excited for it to go live and for me to bid on stuff. You're going to bid on your own stuff? Is that allowed? Isn't that cheating? No, because I can get out bid. Yeah, but, but aren't you pushing up the value of things? No, because I could buy them for those values and... You, you have know. to buy it if you win it. Well, yes, of course. That's, I'm, that's I'm, the point. I'm, I'm feeling a little, uh, a little dirty about this kind of almost unethical <laughs> approach to to bidding on your own items. Well, they're not my items. They're they're in an auction that I curated. I won't be bidding on things that I myself put in the auction because they're out of the house for a reason. Mm-hmm. You know, those things are not coming back. Good. If I have anything to say about it. Okay. So, but there, there's at least one thing that that I'm hoping that I, w- I have the highest bid for that will be a Father's Day present for someone in this room. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Your mention of Father's Day has made me... <laughs> Remember Mother's Day? ...be horribly aware. <laughs> Isn't that this weekend? No, I don't think so. Isn't it? It better it better not be. I thought it was the first weekend in May. The May. first the first the first Sunday in May, I thought. May fourteenth, so that's next Sunday. 
That's not this Sunday. Oh, that's a day of execution at least. Yes. That reminds me I need to to wrap the um, autographed Rudy Giuliani book that I got for my mom for B- Mother's Day. What? And send it to her. Oh, and the also the autographed Marco Rubio book. Oof. <laughs> She'll like them. <laughs> Oof. I mean, I try to keep my politics out of this podcast right. because it's not a politics podcast. It's a Coronation Street podcast, yes. as, we, as we will prove in a little while. In a little bit. But yikes. Remember when she bought me one of Bill O'Reilly's books for Christmas and yeah. then didn't understand why I was unhappy about it? Yeah, but at least you told her that you were unhappy with the gift that she'd given you. Right. And I feel like you're so close to getting it. She'll actually like these things. Right. Because she's a Republican. Most of my family are Republicans. I think she's a little bit beyond that. But anyway. That's why we live 800 miles away. But anyway, here's a fun fact for you. Oh, oh, good. We had more downloads in the last two years in Iraq than we have from the Isle of Man. (laughs) There'll be another fun fact next week. Do you think, are are those like British soldiers? Are there British soldiers in Iraq still? Are there American soldiers in Iraq still? Officially, I don't think so. Hmm. Shall we preamble, my dear? Yes, please. Give us some of that. Oh, how was your week? No, <laughs> too late. You've already <laughs> agreed to preamble. So give us some of that Nina Nina too late Cory news. Yikes. Oh. Some of your Cory news. Is... Condolences. Oops. To the family of Maria Charles, who played Lena Thistlewood on Cory. And once played Maureen Lipman's mum in the TV series Agony, proving once again how very small of an island the United Kingdom is. I remember Agony. Do you remember I th- I th- Ecstasy? I, th- I think she was a... Uh, was she an Agony aunt? Was that what it was? Yeah, she's an Agony aunt. Not do her mum. Do you know what that is? <sighs> Does it have to do with funerals? <laughs> no. What is it? So it's a... It's an ant. It was an ant. <laughs> it's a... Um, oh, and we're talking about ants. And that, <laughs> right, was, yes. that was an actual Yes, yes, yes. That's isn't, why I brought it up. Isn't it hilarious when things like that happen? Yes. That the listeners have no idea about. Correct. It's a column in a newspaper where people write over oh, the problems yes, right. and the agony ant gives ill-informed right. advice. Like, 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 dear... Dear, dear, dear. Yeah, it was dear... It's Dear Amy now. I can't remember it, what it was when I was a kid. It was Dear Somebody, Dear Emily or something. But anyway. Maria Charles, you say? Yes. Yeah, she was 93. Yes. Decent innings. Decent innings indeed. Condolences to the family of Barbara Young. Oh. Who played Doreen Fenwick on The Cobbles. She was 93. I believe. So good innings on her as well. So was Maria Charles. Okay, so she was 92. But still, in the 90s. That's pretty good. And uh, uh, Barbara Young was also in uh, the Wine and Roses show, I believe. The Wine and Roses show. The Wine and Roses show. Oh, fuck's sake. Last of the Summer Wine. Oh, okay. Never mind. She was also in I, Claudius. Yeah, um... And she was also, no, Maria Charles was in um, Hot Fuzz. They both had excellent careers, both in and out of Corey, and condolences to their families, both of them. By all accounts, very lovely ladies. And finally, condolences to Scott Ratcliffe, whose marriage to Kim Marsh has ended after 19 months. This is a, a very cheery uh, <laughs> Corey news about people who are no longer in the show. Yes. Well, obviously two of them are no longer in the show because they are no longer on this earth. Yeah, but and f- when were they last in the show? Neither is Kim Marsh's marriage. I mean, I think Maria Charles was in the 90s, maybe. So a good 30 years ago. 2005, I believe. But anyway, that's Corey news. So let's uh, let's move on then to yes, to everyone's a critic. Getting good use out of that former YouTube music. Yeah. 
So you may remember, Helen, last week, Daisy bought us our coffees. Yes. And apologised for an email rant that I didn't receive. Correct. So I said, do you know what? I think they should probably send it in again. Yes. And, and so they did. Woohoo! Oh, are you going to actually read it? Yeah. So yeah, Daisy got in touch to say, here's the rant, and I've added some some other stuff on it. So it's, a, it's an expanded rant. Now, Woohoo! Now, My favourite kind. The rant is essentially bullet points. So you may need to keep up. And are these bullet points on the show or on us? Both. I, I invite you to guess which. Daisy starts with the auction music and 10 exclamation points. The option music? Auction music. Oh, the auction music, yes. Then the cap, the cap, the cap! I think it's Steve's. Oh, yes. Addy explaining rape to Aaron like the teacup thing makes sense and he still isn't getting it. Nope. Good point. Poor Dee Dee arriving at the show and constantly dealing with crap. Can't believe she's holding out for Sarah and holding those secrets. I'd actually go to Dollywood continuously if I was her. Right. Well, you, it's a it, it's a very expensive airplane ticket from California to Tennessee, I think was my point. DS Swain's return, delighted as we were. Excellent. Love the hospital theme tune so much. I love it as well. It's good. I think it's my favourite one. It's good. Paul will hurt the family so much more as he leaves it so long, telling them horrendous. He also says himself, as we said last week, how much he can't catch a break. It's gutting. The car thing is so stupid and meaningless. Try and spend some time with Gemma and Billy. As awful as that would be. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Daisy. Thank you, Daisy. Pastoral care my arse. Billy is useless. Cannot reply on Fane Craig's storyline after his spreadsheet crap. No, no, no. So I think Daisy more than delivered on the promise of, of a rant. Ah, yes. So that's it. The, the only stuff she said about us was the theme music. Do you, why are you disappointed about this? Because I like criticism. I feed upon it. We don't get enough. Oh, you don't suit your top. There you go. <laughs> and now, Will Podcast for then Coffee. I'll take it off. Noted. <laughs> We're drinking the wrong coffees this week. <gasps> oh no! I have a double barrel Canada Dry Zero Sugar though. And I have iced tea in my Captain Kirk glass because yesterday was May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. Mm -hmm. So Star Trek. It's a joke. I had to explain to a woman today. Oh, um, this, this woman came into the... Um, to the auction house to drop some things off and she noticed my tattoo and so we started talking about star wars and she said that she went to this brewery yesterday this brewery 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 right brewery <laughs> and she was sitting there and these people came in wearing star wars costumes hmm. and she was a bit confused and then she discovered that they were having a uh, star wars uh trivia and I said, yes, because it was Star Wars Day. And she's like, Star Wars Day? And I was like, yes, May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. And she's like, oh, well, I'll remember that for next year. And that conversation was all started by my lovely Princess Leia tattoo. I'm still curious about your Captain Kirk glass, though. What that's got to do with anything? It's a, it's a, it's a joke because people, people jokingly post Star Trek memes with star wars sayings and vice versa just to rile people up yeah. so it was a joke the winter nights must just fly by the chris pine the, the talk Captain of the Kirk. street is and will always be free on your podcast provider and on the youtubes don't be forgetting the youtubes here helen but if you think our show is worth anything more than the time it takes to listen to it and if you want to show your appreciation, you can buy us next week's coffee by going to ko-fi.com. That's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. And we'll be very grateful, won't we, Helen? Yes. Yes. And now, this. Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, welcome to last year tonight with me, John Oliver. Just enough time to quickly talk about a crafty one on the Kazi. Ooh, a crafty one on the Kazi. Is this sex on the couch in front of the Netflix? That's with right. Sally and Tim. 
That's right, this is Homeless Stew, who was living at number one at the time and was smoking on the toilet as he shat. He was having a crafty one on the Kazi. Yikes. Which reminded him of his Navy days, probably for different reasons. <laughs> I was Gavin and you had diabetes. <laughs> we come full circle. Yes. Which made me scared that we wouldn't be able to make fun of Summer anymore. Well, no. The show gave us more reasons than diabetes we to got, make fun of Summer. We got over it. So that's, got, it. that's a year you've had that. Yeah. And that's why my pants don't fit anymore. Goodbye, half and half. Hello, oat milk creamer. And that was the bulk of our preamble, was you talking about you and then at the very last minute asking me how my week went. <laughs> Amy is relieved to learn that Max has survived his leg surgery as this means he can get justice. Homeless Stew forgets to order food for Speed Dial's Eid celebrations and takes drastic measures to put things right. Faye finally receives the results of her test following her phantom pregnancy, but everyone seems more concerned about Craig's reaction. <laughs> hmm. mm. On her first proper day, Aggie fails to make a good impression with Mr Thorne, but discovers some unsettling information about Peter's liver transplant. Uh-oh. The Undertaker's mistake rate goes through the roof as the self-imposed sleep deprivation starts to take its toll. Kirk dreams up a noisy way to incentivise the Knicker Factory sales team. Do you remember what his noisy way to incentivise the Knicker Factory sales team was? Was it a kazoo? L- louder. Symbols. He had an air horn that he blasted every time somebody made a sale. Yikes. Did that get boring quickly? Yes. I believe it did. Abby goes to extreme lengths in an attempt to talk Toya out of marrying Imran. Ken writes a song. Steve does platoon. And Gail knows what she's talking about. Her moment of the week was Kirk with his motivational air horn, so we must have enjoyed it, I guess. (laughs) And her boring moment of the week was an extra complaining that her husband can't get his operation. And that was Coronation <laughs> Street and the talk of the street. This Can you imagine last year? You finally get on Coronation Street. They actually give you a line, so you get paid a little bit. And then two asshole podcasters in the mm-hmm. United States call you the boring moment of the week. Yep. Do you know we're dicks? <laughs> Fame is a fickle mistress. It is. <laughs> shall Just we, ask us. Shall we dive in, my dear? Yes, please. Our first storyline this week is Tim's mum about the house. See, that's my favourite of our of our musical jingles. That's good as well. Yeah, it's my favourite. On Monday at home, Tim is desperately trying to get a hold of Tim's mum, who is ghosting his texts. Sally tells him to respect what Tim's mum wants and urges him to apologise to her. And in his role, Stephen gets a text confirming that their visas to Las Vegas have come through. So it's all systems go. I wonder what visas he's talking about. I don't know. (laughs) Shona overhears this, promises to keep Stum because she's got the idea that the two of them are getting married, and then immediately sends a message to Plat Chat. Plat Chat. Which I think is their WhatsApp group. Yeah, it's a family chat group. Still don't know what that is. Right, because we don't have family Stephen of course we want to talk to right Stephen of course is on plat chat so shakes his fist at Shona and calls her a cow meanwhile Tim's mum has found flights but they leave this afternoon whoa the the soonest I've been able to get a flight is the next day right and I booked a flight for the the following morning or the following afternoon the the previous late afternoon early evening so a little over 12 hours ahead i guess is that pre or post covid that was pre-covid yeah so maybe it's it's different now that fewer people are flying and also the price doesn't necessarily come down no because if you want it at the last minute that means that you really want it right and i think i got gouged a little bit i think i paid two grand for that you typically do yeah Mm -hmm. anyway anyway and coronation street From Weatherfield Airport, you can get a direct flight to Las Vegas at less than 24 hours notice. Cheapest chips. Viva Las Vegas. Tim and Sally come into Nina's roles. Sally pleading for civility. Tim apologises for being out of order. Tim's mum is sorry too. Sorry that it took so long for Tim to show his true colours. So Tim snaps that Stephen is a slippery shite and no better than Tim's dad. 
Stephen wants a square go and Tim looks keen to oblige but Shona breaks up before it can get started. Tim storms out and when he's gone, Sally learns of the Vegas plan. So Sally rushes home to tell Tim who's hoovering so he can have a good think. He's not having this Vegas pish and makes a solemn oath to put a stop to the whole thing. Meanwhile, Stephen heads to the factory where Michael is working on a bank holiday to clear the backlog, whatever that is. Stephen tells him of his Vegas plans and leaves Michael and Sarah to look after the place while he's gone. Later, Stephen and Tim's mum drop into Sally's to pick up Tim's mum's big suitcase. Right. I think every family has a big suitcase. I know we do. Yep. My friend Susan borrowed it when she went to Disney World so she could load it up with figurines. They're expensive things, big suitcases. Yeah. Things that we always had that were always referred to as the big something. Right. The big light in the living room. Uh Uh-huh. Turn the big light on. Don't turn the big light on. No. It it uses so much electricity. Right. Like you're going to... And it's so bright. Like you're going to pay like 50 bucks because you've turned the big light on for five minutes. And the big suitcase. Well, it's a pretty big suitcase. I think my friend Neil gave me that. I thought I stole it from my father. Our big suitcase. I, he definitely gave me a suitcase that I brought over the last uh-huh. time I came across. Huh. Maybe we I'll have, have to, I'll have to have a closer look at it. Maybe we have two big suitcases. <laughs> we are... We are so middle class. So upper middle class. <laughs> well, yes. Big suitcase. Tim apologises sincerely, recognises that Tim's mum can make her own decisions and offers his congratulations and welcomes Stephen to the family with a firm handshake. He even offers to give them a ride to the airport and Tim's mum is relieved that they've all made up. But Tim is up to no good. He is. He ushers Tim's mum into his car and while he sends Stephen off to get a long stand, he drives off with Tim's mum. Tim's mum's phone and Tim's phone are notification central as Tim stops at the precinct. You know, if he was going to drive somewhere, he might have driven like a, a little bit further away. Right. <laughs> or just keep on driving. Right, yeah. Just T- don't stop. Tim's mum says all he's doing is delaying things and making things more expensive. Tim says it'll give her time to think. She's the kindest person he knows and he says Stephen is out to fleece her out of her money. Back home, Tim's mum gets through to Stephen and they agree to postpone the flight. And shortly after, Tim and Tim's mum get back. Stephen congratulates him for ruining Tim's mum's dreams. And Tim of accuses... Of getting married in Vegas. <laughs> dreams that she's had for at least 24 Two hours, right? Tim accuses Stephen to his face of gold digging Tim's mum and remarks how convenient it is that he was also coercively controlled. Isn't that handy? Right, after you found out that my mum was coercively controlled, all of a sudden you were also co- coercively controlled. Mm-hmm. A, yeah. a rare uh, bit of insight. Yes, from, from the Timothy. From Tim there, yeah. And I was so disappointed when that didn't really go anywhere because... Well, it felt she like... got a look on her face. Did she? Yeah, this is when she started getting kind of a look on her face where she started thinking... Oh, and then she's overcome by all the stress of the situation and Tim's mum has a turn. And if she was summer, she would have collapsed on the floor. But she's Paula Wilcox and she's not in her 20s anymore. So instead she's eased into a nice comfy chair by Stephen. Right. Later in the community garden, Tim's mum was feeling better. She'd just forgotten to take her blood pressure meds, she tells Stephen. Really? says Stephen. Blood pressure? And he goes, oh, really? Who? They chat about Tim's objections and how other people will think that he's after her money. He seems to have a thought and tells Tim's mum that he'll be back soon and he goes off to have a chat with Adam. Right, because Adam just happens to walk by at that point. Yes. Tim's mum interprets this as him having cold feet and goes back to Tim's to shout at him for a bit. But as they're arguing, Stephen comes back and confirms that he's been to see Adam to draw up a prenup. And once everyone has had a go at explaining to Tim what a prenup is, he seems somewhat calmed now that Stephen won't be able to marry Tim's mum and divorce her and take half her cash like in California. Tim's mum doesn't think she needs one, but is happy if he's happy. She sends him off to get some shampers from Dev's. Corner shop champagne, you're really spoiling us. But instead of going to Dev's... Stephen goes back to the factory where we learn he's up to no good, applying for life insurance in Tim's mum's name. Back home, Whoa. Sally is excited that they have a prenup in the family house, swish. So funny. <laughs> That's great. Ooh, only fancy people have prenups. Mm-hmm. Sure. On Wednesday, Nina rolls, Audrey is annoyed that Stephen and Tim's mum could arrange to get married in Vegas without telling her. 
she rushes off and Stephen decides to let her calm down so as not to agitate Tim's mum's blood pressure, which he, he is now making a big deal about as often as he possibly can. Yes. In the meantime, he tells her that he needs her passport to rebook the flights. Hmm. Sure. Later, Stephen bumps into Owen on the street, who is one of the non-American American knicker people people. Yes. He assumes he's there to see him, so takes him in at the factory for a cup of tea. Meanwhile, Tim and Tim's mum are in the Rovers. He's still adamant that Stephen is a wrong un and is using Tim's mum, but she insists that she can make her own decisions and begs Tim to make amends. As a future son-in-law, he expects to be wooed by Stephen. Yes. Take me out to the ballpark, new stepdad. Right. Buy me an ice cream. Order comes in and this gives Tim's mum a chance to talk to her. Tim's mum apologises for rushing into an engagement in the Vegas thing and she admits they've been behaving like giddy kids. Audrey realises that she's been overprotective and the two of them make up, finding a common bond and being out of their son's lives for years. Audrey, though, says that she needs to be there for the wedding. Audrey needs to be there, so get her a ticket to Vegas too. Can you imagine Audrey in Vegas? I think that would be fabulous, wouldn't it? Audrey sitting at a slot machine for hours on end just getting drunk off of her ass as the waitresses oh. keep bringing her free wine which show do you think audrey would go to Celine Some, Dion? something with feathers something with feathers yes probably so this changes tim's mum's mind about vegas and she goes to the factory where steven is photocopying her passport and then quickly has to stick it in his inside pocket and tells him that she wants to get married in the uk and to make it a family affair she wants Sam to be Stephen's best man. Right. She wants Audrey to have a pillbox hat. Mm -hmm. She's got With all feathers. Right. And Celine Dion. Yes. And she wants somebody else to be there. Lily. She wants Lily to be there. Right. Lily can be the flower girl. Stephen's got his copy of her passport now and life insurance has been confirmed so he doesn't give a fuck either way. Sure, whatever you want. Tim's mum is thrilled and rushes off to set up a WhatsApp group. Wedding bells, spelled right. B E L L E S. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Later in the pub, Stephen bumps into Owen again and learns that he's actually here to see Jenny. Oh. And the two of them are tentatively seeing each other now. Ooh. Stephen hides his jealousy as he celebrates his official engagement with the families. And on Friday, Stephen sees Owen and Jenny leave the Rovers. It seems someone got their hole last night. He quickly well. intercepts the mail. At the factory and seems to have correspondence from the insurance company. Already? <laughs> Pretty quick. In the office, Stephen is checking through the insurance documentation when Owen comes in, happy to confirm that he and Jenny have agreed to meet up later. Stephen goes into the rovers, saying that he's had Tim's mum surgically removed so that he can have a word with Jenny, warning her that Owen is a player who's had more cock ends than weekends. Jenny is gutted. Stephen asks her to stay shtum about it. He still needs to work with the sleaze bag after all, so Jenny agrees. Stephen finally meets up with Tim's mum in the pub and disguises his loathing of her as she describes spending the rest of their lives together. And that's as far as we get with that this week. Loverly. We've, we've discussed. We've discussed how the second Stephen kills a woman, it's, it's kind of all over. Do you think he's actually going to kill Tim's mum? No. He, do you think he'll ever get to that? I mean, he's planning it, clearly. He is planning it. And it's interesting that we... that we, You're right, we have said before that the second that he kills a woman, the joke kind of becomes not really a joke anymore. Correct. Not that... Not that it's funny that Sequel well, Leo and Teddy are dead. Right, but, but the way it is that kind of funny done, that they're it dead. It loses any camp value that it has once right. he, he kills... A poor defenseless old late well, not old lady. Old, a yeah. poor defensive lady like Tim's mum. Right. But I'm starting to find that it's losing some of its camp value a little bit now that Stephen is just being so downright nasty right. about Tim's mum, saying that she's been surgically removed. Right. And the way that he was kinda of talking to her in the in the pub tonight was kind of horrible. He's a horrible person. And, and yeah, He's well, always I, been a horrible person. I know, but it's always been done with this kind of Machiavellian cartoon moustache twirling that I genuinely have been enjoying and finding quite amusing. But 
I don't know, there was something just a little bit more bullying about him this week that certainly wasn't amusing. Yeah. Well, the whole dosing Carla with LSD was not amusing either. There was nothing camp or cartoonish about that. Well, wasn't there, wasn't there no. a bit? See, I felt like there was a bit of it. No. Except maybe like him attempting to get LSD from those kids. But well, the actual I, dosing. But remember, he ended up dosing himself. Tripping out of his tits. Right. And, and that was funny as fuck. And, and yet he didn't learn anything from it, so it felt pointless. Mm. I don't know. There have been aspects of it that I think have been funny. This bit this week, I didn't really... I wasn't really feeling it this week. Mm. I don't know. I haven't been in a great mood this week anyway. That's true. But... You've had kind of a rubbish week. Yeah, but, but this, I don't know, I was kind of ho- hoping for more of that high camp value stuff and it, and it wasn't really happening for me. No, they, which kind of makes me feel like they're winding it down. Jenny's acceptance of his opinion of Owen just seemed a little bit too easily swallowed as well. Right. And then when... Well, Jenny has no reason not to trust him. Let's remember. Well, other than the fact in it that this unsolicited opinion is coming from a guy who you think was maybe wanting into your pants and all of a sudden the guy that you've spent the night with and and seemingly have been uh, getting on like a house on fire with, suddenly this guy, this guy that you thought was after you, now says that this own guy is a creep. I mean, that feels kind of convenient. That feels as convenient as... Tim noticing about the coercive right. control thing. Yeah. And I expected a little bit more from Jenny. From Jenny to see really? through that. And also, don't tell anybody. Right, yeah. Don't tell him I said this, but the guy's a sleaze bag. Oh, don't worry, I won't tell him. Right. Uh, but you're still not going to date him anymore because you think he's a sleaze bag. How are you going to explain that? Hmm. What would you think of Tim kidnapping Tim's mum? It was really anticlimactic. And you're right. They just went to the precinct. Why did they go to the precinct? Why didn't they just sit in the car outside the house? <laughs> they might as well have driven yeah. around the corner. It was weird. Go- gone to streetcars. You know, I like the fact that Tim is so protective of his mum. Mm-hmm. I wish she was as happy with the fact that he's so protective of her. But, I mean, I guess I can kind of see her point as well that, you know, she's a grown woman and everything. And the way that Stephen has really just made everything weird. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that really frustrates me about Stephen is that everybody seems so taken in with him. Mm-hmm. And it's like these people are suppo- some of these people are supposed to be smart. And where's the intelligence here? I don't see it. Well, Carla's never been taken in, I don't think. No. She's never really trusted them. But, you know, she's still not at the factory. So he got what he wanted from her. Well, I think she's realised something that she maybe should have realised anyway a while ago was that there's more to her life than the stupid factory. Right. Right. She still makes an income off the factory, whether she's there or not, I believe. And Peter was going on about his 25 grand that he essentially stole from a dead man now. Right. Yeah. What, What happens when that comes back to bite him? Do you think that ever will come back to bite him? Nope. No. No, that's, I think that's done. I no, think that's as done as... Rufus never even like said, hey, somebody stole my really expensive watch. Didn't seem to notice. So there's, no. there's 25 grand that you've got. There's your mortgage getting paid for, I don't know, a year or two in that flat above the above a cab office. So maybe, maybe more than that, maybe that's three or four years worth of mortgage that's getting paid off by just stealing a dead man's watch. Well done, Peter. Interesting. You should, you should do that more often. Hmm. I don't know. I've never liked Stephen. Right, you've made that clear. I have. Repeatedly. All right. Well, let's move on then. Yes, please. To our next storyline, which is Damon Bad Omens 2. On Monday, Sarah wants her hole, but Adam has to work. And on his way out, he tells her that he's booking the bistro for his birthday lunch tomorrow. Been there. He's Done booking that. his own birthday lunch. Fucking hell, Sarah. Can you do anything? <laughs> In his roles, Adam tells Damon to put a notice outside the bistro to get any objections about the late license thing noted. 
Maria is there to tell him that once this goes to the council, she can't get involved, but she's been happy to help them along with the process so far. So Damon starts to canvas the residents, starting with Todd, who loves the idea of a nightclub in the street. Of course he does. Later, Sarah runs into Damon and he's putting up the notice that Eamon told him about, that Adam told him about. She's had enough of him winking at her and spending all his time with her husband. He tells her that not everything has to be about her. Well, well the winking is definitely about her, so oh, shut yes. up. And then in the rovers later, Sarah and Maria are chatting about the bistro late license. Maria seems very pro about it and Jenny couldn't give a fuck. Stephen shown at her pro as well until Sarah mentions DJs and how the music will be going all hours and getting and people getting three AM kebabs. Imagine the vomit and the litter. And the pee. Sarah says that's what Gail said, and suddenly everyone is against it. So Sarah goes home and explains how it was all kicking off about the late license, but she doesn't mention how she was the one who stoked it all. Adam still thinks they have a good chance, and all this means more business for him and for Nick and Leanne. Everyone's a winner. Gulp, says Sarah. On Wednesday, it's Adam's happy, happy birthday. Yes, and Harry has made him a card. Yeah, that says to Adam, from Harry. Yes. And they're going to go bowling with Harry. Hooray! Soft play, screams Soft Harry. Soft play. And so they go off for lunch at the bistro and Adam takes a call to tell him that some locals are against the late license idea. Uh-oh. Gulp, says Sarah again. Nick is worried about all the money that they've already invested in this and Adam tells him not to worry, he's on it. And then Damon comes in and takes some uh, champagne over for Adam's birthday and Adam oddly asks Damon to join them for their romantic lunch. Yeah. A menage a toi, says Damon. It'll take more than a bottle of champagne for that, says Adam. Two bottles of champagne then. (laughs) Gulp, says Sarah again. Later, she goes to the bar and bumps into Maria who decides to loudly talk about the objections that Sarah raised about the late licence, which is overheard by Nick and Adam and Damon, who are all keen to know why Sarah would sabotage the bistro in Adam's case. Gulp, says Sarah. This was a little bit of convenience from Maria, was it? You're in the establishment that's looking for the late licence. Right. You're talking to someone who has, who's, I think, tells you, I don't want to talk about this right now. Yes. In the earshot of that person's brother, who right. also happens to own the bistro. Yeah, it is. It, it's it's a little too convenient, isn't it? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Sarah quickly throws Gail and Sean under the bus, saying that they objected too. Maria thinks it's a good thing, as this means people get informed about it. Mm-hmm. Adam, though, is furious that Sarah went behind his back. And she accused him of doing the same with Damon and their stupid bromance. Either way, that's his birthday celebrations fucked. And he's not going to go bowling with Harry. He's the worst stepfather ever. Later, Adam takes credit for what Maria said by encouraging Nick to go on a charm a charm, charm offensive. offensive with the other businesses and tell the residents the sort of clientele he's looking to attract. Meanwhile, Damon is meeting Sarah outside the factory to talk about her scuppering the late license. He plays it cool saying he has one goal now, which is turning the bistro around. If she has other issues, that's her problem, and she's the only threat to everyone else's happiness, unless she can't keep her mind off his goodies. On Friday, Sarah is up and apologetic to Adam, but he's only a little in the mood to listen to it. He values Damon as a client and suggests that she apologises to him too. So she goes to the bistro to apologise to Nick and Leanne, but they are not in the mood to listen to it. And as it turns out, Sarah isn't much in the mood to make it and points out again that the noise is going to piss off their normal clientele and Damon's a scumbag. Lovely apology, says Leanne. In the rovers, there are some scenes of the older residents looking forward to the coronation. Daniel says that when it comes to the national anthem, he prefers the Marseillaise. And finally, I found something that I can agree with Daniel on. Isn't it, isn't it funny that they're taking all this time to talk about the coronation on the show when they barely talked about Easter? It's mm, like, or no, not like really. COVID or even Elizabeth dying. They didn't really talk about that too much. And yet they're making a huge deal about the coronation. They're like, everybody's got a little Charles flag. They've got a little flag. Yes. Conveniently without the hot dog fingers. Which is probably for the best. Probably for the best. Nobody wants to see that. No. I didn't feel like they made an awful big deal about it. 
Yeah. I, I was expecting them to make a bigger deal about it than they did because really uh, this morning or I think it was this morning had a special from Coronation Street with some of the the stars of the show given their two pence worth that you know the the Coronation Street is named after the Coronation which was something that the show actually addressed and right and how it was named Friday, something else before Albert Street mm. yeah but uh but no, I, I expected them to make a, a far bigger deal of it than they did. And I didn't think there would be anything in the way of a dissenting voice. And there wasn't much in the way of the, a dissenting yeah, voice. Yeah, there wasn't. But Daniel was the, probably as close as as they were going yeah, to get to Yeah, but he it. got booed by the old, by the, by the old greyheads. And that's absolutely fine. I mean, I don't give a fuck about this. No. Because we're in America. And we even are. if I was back in scotland i wouldn't give a fuck about it because i'm in scotland right but if you if you want to give a fuck about it if it's something that interests you then who am i to yuck your yum right Mm -hmm. what i was hoping for though is that as far as i can make out the balance of opinion on this thing is very much divided this isn't a a universal cause by by any means so if they were going to spend some time up in it i think in the interest of balance maybe not on a scale of parity or anything like that but there should have been some voices of dissent especially considering some of the characters on the street are very very poor and having a very hard time Mm -hmm. making ends meet and feeding their families and i don't expect them to go to that level of complaint about it Uh uh-huh but I was glad for Dan- for Daniel to be there and men- mention the Marseillaise, which objectively is a better national anthem. Right. You know what's even better? The Spanish one's pretty good as well. Oh, Canada. Oh, Canada's good. And the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> <laughs> I do actually think that Star Spangled Banner is a good national anthem. It is. By, by, again, by any measure. It it's is. a good tune. Okay. It's a good tune and it tells the a good verses, story. The verses that we still sing are good. <laughs> Well, there are, there are yeah. verses of uh, the British the, National Anthem right, that, that are, have been dropped. Yes, for re- similar reasons. Rebellious Scots to crush, etc. <laughs> but yeah, I was glad that, that Daniel was there as a small voice mm-hmm. of dissension. And I'd spend too much time talking about this. Right, yes, we were talking far too much about this. Nick drops in and invites a lot of them to a residence meeting at the bistro. Privately, he asked Gail what our problem is with the late license because he's been speaking to Sarah. But Gail is confused, more than usual, because she doesn't give a shite about it. Sarah must have got her wires crossed. So Nick, who doesn't work at the factory, turns up at the factory to shout at Sarah about lying about Gail having a problem with the late license. She says, well, it doesn't matter because lots of other people have a problem with it. Nick tells her to keep her nose out and is manhandled out of the building by Kirk. <laughs> Maybe. In the beast later, Jenny doesn't mind healthy competition and Debbie doesn't think it'll happen and Aggie thinks A on E on a Friday night would suggest it's a bad idea. Everyone is worried about urine. Nick and, and Leanne are and Aggie stalling. has a new haircut. Did she? Yes, she's got bangs now. Or longer bangs. Nick and Leanne are stalling and covering. They explain that they want a late licence but people want to hear from Dame... They explain why they want a late license, but people want to hear from Damon, who is busy getting the shit beaten out of him in another storyline. Why do they want to hear from Damon, who is like a silent partner? They want to hear from him because he's the one with experience of running oh, places uh, with late licenses. Right, yes, that's true. The residence group of Ancient Souls think that Damon's no-show is not a great sign of how seriously he's taking their concerns, and so Leanne has to ply them with more drink to get them to stay. So later, everyone's half-gassed. Leanne is furious that Damon hasn't showed up. But then he does come in and apologises for being late, explains that he got mugged at an ATM and no one seems to believe it, apart from Ken. The others are now firmly in the no camp. Sarah bumps into Damon later and offers commiserations about his face and asks that Nick and Leanne are kept out of whatever he's into because they've been through enough. Damon takes the hump and says he would explain if you thought that Sarah was remotely interested in the truth. Mm-hmm. And that's as far as we get with that this week. Yes. <clears throat> And I mean, we'll get we'll get further into this later on, but the whole 180 of Damon's character, which is called out, by the way, in the other storyline by another character saying, what happened to you? Mm. You're like a completely different person. You know, 
it just it just makes the whole oh we don't trust him we don't like this guy who you know nobody is concerned about his face apart from Aggie right who offers to to, to look treat at him, it right? right you know people are like oh he was mugged so he's a bad guy well they don't believe him right yeah something happened to his face and Sarah's, somebody beat him up and Sarah's been doing some uh, poisonous whispers behind his back yeah. about what his previous business really was wink, right wink. so I think she's been doing quite a bit in the background to to discredit him I think it's a little weird that she does seem jealous of Adam and Damon's relationship very much so you know and I don't know if that's just because she has slept with both of them but it's explained to her that Damon's his client about you. and right. Damon's his client what do you, right. you want me to do to ignore him all the time? Mm-hmm. I don't think that would happen. Mm. Yeah, it's funny. Do you think they're going to get that late license? I don't know. I don't think this is the important part of the story, though. I think this is no. just a vehicle for the important part of the story, which is Sarah and Damon are going to have sex again. Right. But it felt like Nick was just refusing to even try and, and settle people's concerns he, right. he said to them at one point you know if, it, if the music's too loud come and talk to me and we can work it out right but also they seem to be thinking that this place is going to be kicking out at four o'clock in the morning right pubs in england i think still shut at 11 right so this late license could be something that takes them at 12 o'clock 12 30 right we're not talking about two and three o'clock in the morning well i think what they're thinking is if they stay out later then de- the kebab shop's going to be open even later and they're going to go to the kebab shop after the bistro which, to buy kebabs which is, which is true. to soak up the alcohol. Yeah. And then they're going to just just all pull out their penises and pee all over the street. I don't know if that's... Rivers of pee everywhere. Is that how drunk people work? I think some people are like that. Yeah. But if the pub chucks out at 12.30... Mm-hmm. You're going straight to the kebab shop. Right. Say you're an hour in line. You're not an hour in line because if you're an hour, an hour in line, you're going home. Right. Say you're half an hour in line. Right. So by one o'clock, you're done. You're walking home with your kebab. You're maybe peeing in number eight's garden. Mm-hmm. And then that's it. And then like you're on the train or you're in a taxi cab. Or the cab. tram or whatever. It yeah. It, doesn't, it seems like he could have done more to... To reassure them right. and not to just kind of stare like a deer in the headlights waiting for Damon exactly, to show up. Exactly, because presumably he's he's right. the one that's applied for this, so surely he, they've right. had surely, these conversations. Surely there's something more he and Leanne can say while waiting instead of, would you like another glass of free wine, Evelyn? <laughs> right. They should have got their, their plans of what they're, in, what they're intending on doing what they themselves are going to be doing to stop this antisocial behaviour, which would be like having a bouncer on the door to stop people coming in to get horrendously drunk. They'd have something to stop serving drunk people and all that. So, mm-hmm. so I mean, there are steps that you can take. Otherwise, nightclubs wouldn't exist. Right. But nightclubs generally don't exist where people sleep often. Well, when I stayed in Stirling, there was two nightclubs within a two-minute walk. Right. And I never heard them. Really? They, they kicked out at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, but you heard, like, the junkies on the street below yeah. you. Yeah, at 9.30 at night. <laughs> at six o'clock in the evening. Right, yeah. They were all in bed. I don't I don't remember ever being woken up at, like, four o'clock in the morning by drunk people outside. No. I, I got woken up by drunk people, but not, like, hordes of them. Right, yeah. And I mean, typically we we get if we're getting woken up at like four thirty five o'clock in the morning, it's because our neighbor works early hours, so is like flashing reason, their headlights in our bedroom window, and they have to have their car running for five minutes before they drive off anywhere. Right? For, yeah, for whatever, whatever reason. reason. When we lived on Knight Street, there would be quite a few drunk people walking by our house at odd hours mm-hmm. because the QD is open and you know so they'd buy beer and they'd be drinking beer walking down the street which is illegal but it was four o'clock in the morning in a small tiny town so what are you gonna do 
but you live on a street with businesses anyway already there are i'm sure there is a, a book of things that you can do to to try and negate antisocial behavior by being a business owner who operates at that right. at that time i'm sure there are things that they could have been doing but do you and know for what? Sake, this is not the important part of the story the line. former mayor peed in the he peed in the park the little peed in the victoria garden, yeah. garden. and there have been stabbings and bombings on the street <laughs> i think drunk and that's people, just one person i think drunk people are the least and shootings and floating guns Right. And knifings. Oh, I said that already. So I feel like drunk people peeing in your doorstep are the least of the problems of the people who live on the street. Yeah, I don't. I don't think this is the the main thrust of the storyline. I, I think this is just a, a complication to to get eventually Sarah and Damon to sleep with each other again, and then Sarah and Adam to sleep with each other again, and then and then the who's Sarah the daddy storyline yeah. can finally get started. Woohoo! <sighs> All right, let's move on to Aaron Can't Handle the Truth. No kidding. On Monday, Amy is looking for her white trainers and they're on Tracy's feet. That's hilarious. Amy is heading into town with a mate from uni and this news makes Steve and Tracy very happy. Steve offers her a lift, but she's going to get the bus. She's independent, see? Then Debbie drops into the garage to see Abby and Aaron and they're having a wee cup up. He gets a call from his dad as he explains how he's pulling his weight at home since Kev left making dinner and babysitting. And Debbie is very impressed. Husband material, that, says Debbie. And Abby makes an Abby face. Right. And then Debbie drinks from Aaron's empty cuppa. <laughs> Meanwhile, Amy is getting a busy bus into town and it's so crowded and she's sitting next to a stranger that she has a panic attack and has to quickly get off the bus. In Nina's roles, Aaron and Abby meet Aaron's dad, whose name escaped me for the longest time, but it's Eric, isn't it? Yeah. Who lets him know that his nan died last night. Thanks. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. His dad is still sober and wants to thank Abby for looking after Aaron. Eric is under the impression that Aaron is seeing someone else now that Summer dumped him for the thousandth time, and he demands to take everyone out for dinner at the bistro to celebrate Aaron's nan being dead, and he won't accept no for an answer. Eric is a prick he's weird isn't he he's weird They're, i don't know if this is just the show's interpretation of a, a sober alcoholic mm. but he, he has a hard because they've got peer they have a hard time reading the room or he has a hard time reading the room mm. you know and there's yeah i think there's a difference because eric seems like he's still kind of a dry drunk whereas peter seems much more further into his recovery and has ways of kind of counteracting that kind of dry drunk antisocial behavior hmm. better steve gets home from fresco and uh, doesn't seem surprised to see amy there she admits to having a panic attack on the bus she couldn't cope being out and about in crowds she worries now about the same thing happening in the lecture and not finishing uni at all so steve suggests a quiet afternoon playing a board game and maybe speaking to Uncle Peter about getting one of his jigsaws. Right. I love that that's like still a family joke. It's a thing Peter's now, jigsaws. Yeah. At Tracy... At Tracy? At Tracy. I was thinking about Tracy going upstairs to listen to tapes. That's why I did that. <laughs> At dinner, Eric wants to know what happened with Summer, but Aaron says things just didn't work out. Eric tells Abby to pick what she wants from the menu to repay her for all she did for Aaron. And Abby is just so uncomfortable at this dinner. She announces that she needs a shite, and as she's heading off to the bogs, she bumps into Steve and Tracy on their way in. Relations are still frosty, and Abby still seems to be Team Aaron, saying Amy retracted her accusation. Tracy doesn't correct her, but does point out that she stuck by Abby when she was up to her tits on the muck and she and Steve leave without ordering, which allows Abby to finally get to the bogs for that shite. Yay! On Wednesday, now that Eric the Alke is back in the show, he turns up at the garage in the middle of the working day to tell Aaron that he's got a new place to live, and he wants Aaron to stay with him now. Aaron, though, would prefer to stay with Abby for the time being if it's all the same to him. Sure, says Eric, and he looks like he needs a drink now. Abby makes an Abby face again. At number one, Steve is wearing his buxom lady in underwear apron and has a rolling sausage that's stolen by Amy. Red sauce or brown sauce or no sauce at all, Amy? 
brown sauce. Brown sauce all the way. Yeah, it's it's even it's even weirder now that they keep putting him in that apron. What would be weirder still would be him wearing that apron while wearing a baseball cap indoors during the day. Right. Yeah, but his daughter's been raped and he's wearing this apron. It isn't a a rape apron. No, it but a, it's... It isn't a rape apron. Right, but it's, you know, sexy buxom lady. Mm-hmm. It does, it does feel a little tone deaf, doesn't it? Now, there's nothing about it. There isn't a, a leap from there to rape. No. But I get why it's, I get why it's a bit icky. Yeah. I, 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 and on, on the other side, I get why it's funny to put Steve in an apron like that. Right. Because this is Steve, who, let's remember, used to have these velociraptor fights with Tim. Well, one time. In, in the office and things like that. And they don't do that sort of thing anymore, but they still want to make him a little kooky. Maybe it's that the apron is a bit of a objectification of women. Yes. Maybe that's what makes it a bit icky. icky. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly why. So Amy tells him that she's getting back into the swing of things at uni and is making new friends who don't know her history. And she's quite pleased about that. Back at the garage, Abby gently talks Aaron into giving his old man another chance so that she can get her spare room back. Plus, this is Eric's latest chance to and maybe a last chance to make it up to him. So Aaron agrees. Back at number one, Steve has seen Aaron packing up outside Abby's. Amy thinks Abby has seen sense, but Steve thinks chance would be a fine thing. And if Aaron is moving off the street, though, at least Amy can get a small part of her life back. And that's as far as we get with that this week. I think Abby's kind of, I don't know, not coming around necessarily. I don't know what, what Abby's thinking at the moment. No, she's definitely uncomfortable with Eric. Yes. Which makes me kind of surprised that she's encouraging Aaron to move back in with his dad. She was also a little uncomfortable when Eric was talking about how he'd dumped or been dumped by someone that had somebody else on the go. Right. Because who was the somebody else that was maybe on the go? Right. Because it must have been, it must have been Amy, mustn't it? Who knows? So what story has he been telling his dad about this? Right. And I didn't really know that. They were Maybe in communication too yeah. much. So, I don't know. You'd think Abby would be, given that she is recovering as well, would be maybe more accepting of Eric or know Eric and his ways a little bit. Well, I think just... that's why she's kind of uncomfortable with him. But still, why? if, if you're uncomfortable with him, why are, why are you shoving this kid that you supposedly care about Back into the open arms of his dad. Because after last week, I was really surprised that she was having this confrontation with Stephen Tracy. Right. Because last week, it seemed that she was having some doubts about it. Mm -hmm. She was having lots of looks and listening to some of the half conversations that she was picking up. And she had questions. Yeah. And I think she asked him again if he told her everything. Right. So she's clearly not believing this story 100%. But then that was a really... A really weird confrontation to have with her old friend Tracy, Tracy, because right. they were they were pally, and Tracy right. was there for her, and, yes, and stuff. So, and why Tracy and Steve didn't correct her and say, "Well, Amy has realized," you know, Amy only said that because she wanted it to go away, right. sort of thing. Right. Yeah, that was weird as well. Yeah. So that's Aaron now living somewhere unspecified with right. his dad, but. He's still going to be coming back for his job, right? presumably. Yes. This isn't him off the street yet. No, not completely. So Amy's, I don't really know if it's Amy's nightmare, but whatever it is, it's not over yet. No. I think they're doing a good job of her trying to pretend that everything is fine and then everything's not fine. I'm not totally in love with how they present panic attacks. No. Which is the same way they present tripping on LSD and <laughs> drug overdoses. Well, yeah, more or less, yeah. So that I kind of wish was better. But the fact that Amy is not okay mm-hmm. is good. Yep. It's it's good that they're not trying to make it like Amy's all okay now. The, the panic attack on the bus was shorthand for a panic attack. Right. 
you're you're learning nothing about a panic attack no. from from what you saw, but you yeah. understand, I think. And I think we've all been there, haven't is. we? We've all been there where we're in a crowded space, especially in this day and age after COVID, mm-hmm. where you're like, no, there are too many people here. Yeah, I, I just need, need to get out it's of here. too peoplely. I yeah. need to say goodbye. Right. Yeah. It's like, have you seen that uh, that video that's been going around of people coming home from the Taylor Swift concert and just like totally stuffing the subway? No. Yeah. It's like that. I don't think I could be in the New York subway or the London Underground yet. Yeah. And then just have a whole bunch of Swifties just pile in on top of you. Yeah. I don't think I could do that. No. Yeah. Especially since one time I caught pneumonia on the New York subway. Yeah. Yeah. You'll do that. It happens. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on to our next story, which is George's hobby. On Monday, in the middle of the day, George has sneaked home to have another wee go in his big boat. Todd <laughs> thinks like that. that he's obsessed and throws his cereal bowl on the coffee table, which snaps George's bosun in half. But not like that. In the pub later, George complains to everyone about his broken bosun, which Brian overhears. He's a fellow model shipbuilder. Yes, of course he is. And I don't think anyone is disbelieving that. <laughs> no. George explains the bother that he's having with his rigging and the two of them go uh, to look up over the instructions. Back home, Todd is surprised to see Brian there as George manoeuvres his rigging into place, but not like that. (laughs) Todd is keen to order pizza and Brian, who is going home to a frozen dinner for one, pulls on the old heartstrings to get an invite to stay for tea. What with him being Italian, pizza's right up his street. There you go. When Todd comes back from the pizza place, he's shocked to discover that Brian has brought his model of the Endeavour over, reckoning that they could have it finished in a couple of days. Todd thinks the boats are reproducing and points (laughs) out that there's a small fleet of ships in the living room now and there's nowhere to do any living. Then he discovers that the thing that's accidentally been glued to something else this week is Todd's mug to the table. Accidentally being glued to something else of the week. (laughs) Because last week's accidentally being glued to something else of the week was George's fingers. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and Brian asks Todd if he has any nail polish remover. And Todd says, it's my mom's. <laughs> <laughs> I posted on uh, Monday or Tuesday uh-huh. that the, these scenes with right. Brian and George and, and Todd, Todd were my favorite thing from, from yes. Monday. They were yes. T- Todd is, Todd is They're hilarious. They're so cute. They're so cute together, the three of them. Todd's, uh, and by extension, Gareth Pierce's delivery of comedy lines. Yes, so good. Is, so good. It's just perfect. Yes. And the look on his face as well. What did his mug say? It was like, world's greatest something. I didn't. I didn't. Fun? Was it that? Gay Maybe. boyfriend? Maybe. Undertaker? <laughs> boyfriend stealer? Any more guesses? Homewrecker. That'll do. On Wednesday, it's early morning and Brian and George are hard at it. But not like that. Building their model ships and fucking. (laughs) George has a special (laughs) surprise to show Brian. But not like that. It's a cock ring. (laughs) No, no hell on it isn't a cock ring. It's a brass maiden head for his golden hind model or whatever. Who cares? Later, Brian meets with George and Nina Rolls and has a copy of the latest edition of Monthly Seaman. But I like that. There's a competition running for Model Seaman of the Year. But I like that. And he suggests that they both enter. But I like that. George needs some encouragement. (laughs) Not like that. But is game. But not like that. At home, cynical Todd thinks that the offer was simply to ensure that Brian didn't come last, which seems to be a bit of a stretch. But when George can't find the maidenhead, his thoughts dash to the notion that maybe Brian stole it. And he's encouraged to think that way by Todd, who's just been an asshole. Yes. So George is still looking for the maidenhead when Brian comes in and George (laughs) airs, airs Todd's suspicions, but reckons maybe it was picked up by mistake. Brian is outraged by the accusation. Outraged, I say. And it looks like the two of them are going to fall out over a toy. A toy? London? London? And, and I mean, that's not a toy. You would not give something that tiny to a child. No. They choke on it. And sadly, that's as far as we get with that this week. There was Boo. no more of this on Friday. And I was like so disappointed. Boo. 
I was really enjoying this. The, I, Me too. I was actually enjoying it more before it looked like George and Brian were falling out about it. I don't right. want them to fall out no. about it. I want them to it's be... It's so cute to see them sitting at the table fixing boats together. Because the th- It's delightful. These two lonely old men just kind of bonding. The thing that we're missing from that, though, is Eileen walking in and right. seeing it all. Because none of this would happen if Eileen was there. No. So where's Eileen? She's in Canada. <laughs> because... I don't know. She's going to a Toronto Maple Leafs game? Yes. Sure, that's what she's doing. Go Leafs. Go Leafs indeed. No, I love this storyline this week. I think George being uh, so eager to to become obsessive about this and dogging his work, and again, basically leaving Weatherfield's dead in the hands of Todd and being Right, it was so it. funny it's when hilarious. he's like, he's like, he says to him, no, you can deal with the, with the, <laughs> casket lining salesman guy just don't let him leave any samples because that's you know that's an excuse to come back Mm -hmm. sort of thing and just and it's so funny because there was a time when george would not leave any of this in todd's hands oh no so it's kind of nice it's kind of nice that he's giving todd more responsibility do you know it's a family business now it really is essentially george shuttleworth and son an adopted son right yes and yeah and, and that's that's precious. It is. But the but if you're going to become obsessive about something, the last thing you need is Brian to also be obsessed with it because Brian is going to take that obsession up All to the, the next way level. All the way to right? eleven. Right. Yeah, this, but it's nice. I like it. Yeah, great stuff. More of that, please. More of that, please. Our next storyline is dated the Bergerac. On Friday, Debbie drops into Carlos to see Ryan. All right, ball bags says. <laughs> Carla. That's right. And why? Because that's what Carla says. That's what Carla says now. All right, ball bags. Ryan isn't there, though. He's at the doctor's appointment. Debbie's upset that no one went with him, but Carla insists that everyone is mucking in and taking care of him, so much so that Carla and Peter have cancelled the holiday. Back at Carla's later. And there's the fact that Carla had to show Debbie the cancellation notice. Right. To be believed. Yeah, that was hilarious. Back at Carla's later, Ryan discovers that Carl and Peter have cancelled the trip because he's been raking through their bin. He's a bin what? raker. What? Have you been caught bin raking? No. You must be pretty good at it then. I am. He's pissed and says that he doesn't need babysitting, but he appreciates the sentiment. Later, Ryan has done the dishes, so Carla is obviously super impressed. And Ryan tells her to go off to Scotland anyway. It's booked. I didn't realise they were going to Scotland. Yeah. It's booked. They can't cancel, so they might as well enjoy it. And after some deliberation, Carla finally agrees. So she heads off, and as soon as she's gone, Ryan is on the phone to Crystal, which is really Daisy, but he doesn't know that Crystal is Daisy yet. Correct. Usually he just texts, but now he's phoning her, which is like, "Uh uh-oh. Right. But he gets a generic outgoing voice announcement and just leaves a call-me-back message. And that's as far as we get with that this week. And it's lucky that this is... Daisy's secondary phone mm-hmm. because Daisy is not the sort of person being a big influencer right? where she's not going to have a personal outgoing message. Right. But it must have been just that. Yeah, it was the a number generic, you have dialed is right. whatever. It's right. unavailable at this time. Mm-hmm. Do you know Ryan's uh, scarring on his face, the makeup on this is just, it continues to impress me mm-hmm. and it continues to excel. They've got little little ridges in it as, yeah. it's, as it's healing so it's not just you know plain old makeup there's some prosthetic there that yes. is that's building up yeah and they've got it looking like it is healing because yes. it looks better than it did it, before. absolutely and it's actually at the point now where i don't think this is looking too bad now no it looks like it's going to heal actually all right yeah. I mean, it could be so much worse, right? And it could have been right. in his eye and, and all that sort of stuff. But the way and that they've got it, his it, nose it and looks like it's it's healing <clears throat> yeah, it's just pretty well. The side of his face. Mm-hmm. But I am worried about him picking up the phone and phoning Crystal now because Crystal's never going to answer. No. So he's going to be thinking, why isn't she answering? Yeah, you know, and I don't know. What would she say? Like, sorry. Well, she can't say anything, sorry, right? sorry, I didn't. Sorry, I didn't answer your call. I was on an airplane, and I can't. I can. I can't call. I can only text because I'm in another country. 
I don't know. The way that Daisy's run this, though, is that she's opened up this channel of communication. Right. And she can't shut it down now. No. Because she knows that this is something that Ryan is has now grown to depend upon. Yes. For his mental health. He only right. seems cheery when he's in conversation yes. with Crystal through text. So she can't, she can't stop it now. She has to keep going with it but right. the problem is the longer that she keeps going with it the bigger a deal this is going to be when right. she eventually gets found out because she has to eventually get found out about this correct so what does she do does she just bite the bullet and tell him now because now he's starting to phone now mm-hmm. she's looking at missed calls here yeah and what if she accidentally answers it right and disguises please, her voice please don't let this be hi it's me crystal Please don't let this be how it finally comes out by her accidentally answering it. Because I think, or the way that I'm thinking now, is this is the reason why the Crystal character was impossible to understand what she was saying. Right. I think she's I think she's meant to be Scouse. Right. Daisy is not Scouse. No. <laughs> so She'd have to very quickly attempt an accent. Mm-hmm. And that would be kind of funny to hear her try to do a Scouse accent. But you can't do that accidentally. No. But yeah, this is, I guess, the point of this on Friday was just to remind us of this and also to up the ante a little bit that, that Ryan is now phoning. Our penultimate storyline tonight is HBO Max. On Friday at number eight, Gail's love eggs have fallen out. <laughs> that was what happened, I think, wasn't it? No, she has this this thing that she holds in her hand that sends little stimulations to relax her brain. It's not that kind of thing, but oh, David okay. thinks it's that kind of thing. And that's hilarious. It's like it's like Roy with the eggplant emoji all over again. <laughs> yes, it it was. was it was absolutely hilarious. It, because there's this scene and then there's another scene We'll where get to it. We will get to it. David doesn't want to hear about it, but Gail thrusts it in his face. In other news, Max might be getting considered for early release. And I'm like Really? How? But he only got six months, right? For terrorism. And he's probably served close to three months of that. So this actually, I think, adds up. Ugh. David is cautious and doesn't want to get Max's hopes up, so doesn't plan on mentioning anything to him. I'm curious as to why David has found this out and Max hasn't, but anyway. Yeah, it's kind of weird. In the Young Offenders thing, David has seen Max, who's had a haircut and some haircut. Yes, he actually looks like a skinhead now. <laughs> right. Well done, show. Right. The chat is shit because Max has nothing to talk about and David doesn't want to mention Gail's love eggs or the early release thing. Visiting is over and Max rushes off back to sitting in a cell on his own. Afterwards, back in the pub, David bumps into Daniel and asks if they can have a word about Max. Well, oh And we don't hear what that is, but we see what the consequence of it is. Back in The Young Offenders, Daniel is taking a class which includes an inmate called Gav. Yes. And Gav is a fanny. Gav is a fanny. Well done, show. <laughs> Bravo. Daniel asks the All go- Gavs on TV are fannies, though. This is true. This is true. But if that Gav... For this particular show, to have a Gav who's a fanny... If that Gav was to call Daniel a fanny, <laughs> I think... I, I, I can't imagine how it could get any better than that. Well, if he was Scottish. Right. Yeah, Daniel asked the group to write a journal entry to explain how they've been feeling and what they've been doing. And when Gav informs the group that he's been banging supermodels all night long, Daniel invites them to use their imaginations. So all this is your own fault, Daniel, when that's what they do. Exactly. And all this is obviously a ploy by Daniel to find out how Max is doing so he can report back to David. Right. So they go through their little journal entries and Gav has written a penthouse forums letter by the looks of things. It was hilarious. Daniel isn't impressed and asks Max what he's written and Max says he's written about the massive shit he took this morning. Huzzah! Then Daniel's phone rings and so he goes off to take it and it's from Daisy and while he's away a fight breaks out so when Daniel comes in to separate them he puts his phone down which Max quickly steals. Yes. And then Daniel dismisses the class because he's butthurt that no one took his lame idea seriously. At number Hilarious. one, at number one, Ken was having a snooze when Daniel comes in. He's in the mood because he's lost his phone, and he mentions how he thinks one of the kids took it, and he can't report it because he's not meant to have it in class. Which is what I thought. Why are you answering right. a phone in class? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Well, he says to Daisy, I'm not meant to be taking calls. Well, then why well, did then you take, don't the take the call? Well, don't take the call, right. He hopes that whoever nicked it develops a conscience and brings it back. And then we see, back in The Young Offenders, Max is holding Daniel's phone like he's Gollum from Lord of the Rings. It was hilarious. And one has to wonder where he's going to get a charger for it. <laughs> and that's as far as we get with that this week. So I, I didn't actually mention the bit I thought I did where David walks into the pub Here's Gail talk talking about his about exciter again. It's about, her, about her stimulator to to Nick, and and David does the Grandpa Simpson thing. He does a Grandpa Simpson <laughs> he thing. He does a total Grandpa Simpson thing. And he says, "Nope,", nope. <laughs> and just walks straight back out the pub again. And that was hilarious. That was great. But again, now while that this is hilarious, and this has happened something similar like this has happened before, while what David says and does is hilarious, the thing that I would argue is maybe even more hilarious is Gail's face during it all. Right. Because she gives nothing away. Absolutely not. It's a, she does not it's understand a, why David is, is so uneager to, to hear about her stimulator. It's a bang on straight face that she keeps. So good. Well done, Helen Worth. I was so disappointed that, that Max is back and his old tricks again yeah yeah it's like what's what's going on here i really hoped that when he went into this place desperate to make amends Mm -hmm. has his meeting with alia who Mm -hmm. stands her ground and doesn't you know doesn't roll over for him Mm -hmm. says that she doesn't care he got that kind of closure from that i guess had a hug with david before he was getting sent down right and put out the request for David to come visit. Right. I really hoped that this was going to be the yeah. turning point for him. But then, and I think this is probably quite accurate, before we get to a, a few months down the line, David going to see him, right. they've got nothing to talk about. Right. So they don't talk. They just sit and... And he's officially a skinhead now. Right. <laughs> so that bit I can get. The bit where he, he stole the phone. Right. Who's he going to call? Right. Who is... What, why? Why steal the phone at all? It makes no sense. Well, it makes no sense until we remember the previous story of of phones and Daniel's involvement and Daniel kind of being the bridge between these two storylines. Right. And there's a phone that's going on in this storyline and there's a phone that's going on in that storyline. Right. And how can these possibly converge? Because right. I think that's what's happening here. I think this yeah. is what, what they're setting us up for. Is that somehow Max has to pretend to be... Crystal? Crystal. Crystal Max. Crystal Max. Crystal Light. I quite like that Crystal Max storyline. Hmm. Do you I think th- he can do a Scouse accent? Let's hope so. Hmm. Yeah. The Gale stuff was was great. It was great. People complain about gail becoming a comedy character and you know when you look at classic cory she's in the midst of the richard hillman storyline where she's um well at the moment sarah's just had brain surgery because she was in a car crash right so she's i got stabbed in the stomach so no so uh gail has been in the center of the active storylines and they're they're the big storylines for Mm -hmm. quite some time and none of them, none of none of what Helen Worth is doing twenty years ago mm-hmm. relates at all to anything that Helen Worth is doing now. But, but the character what? evolves, right? And she's so good at doing this. She, and but you know what? When she is called upon to be dramatic, like remember, remember when David got raped, and and you know, and she had that whole monologue. Well, it was about Aiden. It was after Aiden's suicide. Right, yeah. And he's t- and she's talking about how Aiden's suicide makes her worry about David because of the whole rape thing and how that affected his personality and everything. Mm. You know, so she when she is called upon to be a serious act, to do a serious storyline, she can do it. But she can also do the comedic stuff as well. She's got great timing there as well. Not everybody on the show is good at doing both. Yeah. There are some characters who are very good at doing the serious stuff, and when they try to make them do comedy things, it doesn't work. There are characters that are very good at comedy stuff. You try to get them to do something serious, it doesn't work. Gail swings both ways. 
but no, I, I, I like that. I felt you were going that way, and I was going <laughs> to intervene, but I thought I'd let you go. Thank you. I, I think I'm the only person who didn't really care that much for the whole monologue, but I love because it. it felt too, it felt too written for me. Uh-huh. But, but yeah, she's a different, she's a different character now, mm-hmm. and and she's she's there for different reasons and than that's fine. she was there twenty years ago. Right, she's a grandmother now. So. Moving on. Our Moving final storyline tonight is Hello God, it's me, Billy's tax rebate. On <laughs> Monday, Billy is heading off to see a dying parishioner. So he's in a particularly good mood because he's got something to do. <laughs> Paul heads off to work with Billy telling him about the late license and if it might give him more hours. Summer wonders why Paul wants more money. So despite promising not to say anything, Billy blabs. Because everybody wants more money, Summer. <laughs> right. Who doesn't want more money? Welcome to capitalism. At work, Paul is trying to sweeten Nick up about getting more hours by breaking plates and glasses. Dee Dee comes in at the end of his shift and says there's someone she wants him to meet. And at Dee Dee's, she introduces him to Trish, whose late husband had motor neuron disease, and she came over to give Paul some details. Paul is mortified that this has been sprung on him and goes to leave, but Dee Dee encourages him to stay. What does he have to lose? So Trish explains some of the awful things that Paul has to look forward to. Wheelchairs, ramps, a commode... And all of it costs money. He needs financial support. Good job, Trish. Right. He knows that he can get stuff on the NHS, but he isn't ready for this conversation. And Dee Dee reminds him that he can't do this on his own and needs to talk to his family. When Trish leaves, Paul is now completely obsessed with how he doesn't have money for futuristic wheelchairs. Dee Dee tells him that he can't get away from this and he needs to tell Billy. How long can he keep it from him? Paul still wants to get Gemma's wedding out of the way first. Correct. Back at the flat. Paul finds Summer looking for jobs. Have you tried the factory? <laughs> Summer wants to contribute to the run of the flat and she heads off for a shower. When Billy comes home, Paul knows that Billy's told her. And Paul blames himself because all of this is his fault. Summer feels like she needs to get a job to cover for him. And he apologises, says that he's just having a bad day, feeling a bit needy, and tells Billy that he loves him and the two of them hug. That was sweet. Yeah. On Wednesday, Paul is looking up the price of wheelchairs, and guess what? They're not cheap. They are not cheap. You think that it's a chair with some wheels in it. It's How expensive that. can that be? And it's very expensive. Yay. Summer comes in on her way to an agency interview, and this gives Paul a chance to say that an 18 year old shouldn't be working. <laughs> Summer insists that she's doing this because Paul has inspired her by getting side gigs while he's waiting to get back to work for Ed. Paul has gone to see Dee Dee, who isn't happy because they need to work on their defence strategy. But when he hears that there will be journalists at the court, Paul refuses to use his MND as a contributing factor. Right, yes, because Paul, of course, the reporters at court are desperate to tell stories about an unknown man and his med- and his medical issues. And in, in local newspapers in the UK, this thing does happen. <laughs> you would have court scene and there'll be a page about who's been up in court this week okay well yeah there there is that but 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 they're going to report on it whether or not you've got motor neuron disease right so if you're worried about them reading that you've got motor neuron disease they're maybe not going to see that but they're still going to see that you were up in court right and he seems to be forgetting this bit yes dd nips off for a coffee and leaves paul in the empty law office on his own and while he's on his own, rather than going through files, he phones Niall, who promptly hangs up on him. That was hilarious. Later in the bistro, Paul dings a text from Billy, who's wanting to meet up in town later, and then he takes a call from Niall, who has a job for him after all. On his way out after his shift, he bumps into Billy, who is still keen that they go off and do something. Paul lies and says he's off to the movies with Dee Dee, who is lonely now that she's back from LA, and he doesn't think that she'd open up if Billy was there. <laughs> Billy pretends to be understanding about this, but clearly isn't. And no. leaves Paul to it. But of course, the next we see Billy bumping into Dee Dee on the street. Dee Dee is quick to react when Billy mentions the movies and she covers well for uh, Paul's lie. So Dee Dee goes to see Paul at the flat just before he's on his way out. And she cleverly outsmarts Paul, not that that's hard at the moment, by asking him over to hers. But he says that he's heading out with Billy. Hmm. Paul heads to the Fresco car park wearing a disguise of a hoodie and a baseball cap. And uh, Groucho Marx glasses. And, he's, and the waxy moustache thing. <laughs> he's about to drive off in a flash motor when Dee Dee steps in front of the car. She begs him to, to get out, to not be a criminal, and that she'll have to report him to the police or she'll end up being an accessory. This isn't just your life you're affecting now. 
He says it's an insurance scam. No one gets hurt. He needs to pay for Gemma marrying Chesney for fuck's sake. <laughs> and says that she needs to do what she needs to do and he needs to do what he needs to do. And he drives off. Do, do, do. <clears throat> but he doesn't drive far before having a change of heart and returning the car. And he learns that Dee Dee didn't call the cops after all. She tells him that he needs a life raft here. They go back to her place and she's incredulous that he would do this while on bail. She's keen to know who he's doing it for, thinking that if he grasses them up, he'll probably get a lighter sentence. But Paul says he's no grass. Dee Dee says that whoever it was would dob him in in a flash if it was going to get a week off their sentence. That's true. But Paul stands firm and it looks like something Dee Dee has said has given him another terrible idea. Horrible idea. And his terrible idea really is terrible. Yes, it is. He goes round to the bistro and tells Damon that if he doesn't pay him 25 grand, he's going to spill his guts to the police about all the shite that Damon is involved in. Wow. Damon pretends that he didn't hear Paul, but Paul thinks he's a hard man now, tells Damon that he has problems and Damon has the answers, that Damon is a disease and Paul is a cure, and he gives Damon until tomorrow. Wow. Paul gets home and celebrations are underwear because Summer has a job. Woohoo! It, it's bar work and service stuff. Champagne all round. And Paul looks genuinely happy for the first time in ages. Mm. And they're all heading out when Damon bumps into Paul and basically gives him a chance to back out. But Paul is insistent and he wants his 25 grand. Damon steps away as Billy and Summer arrive and gets on the phone to Niall and explains that they have a small problem. Yes. On Friday, Dee Dee runs into Paul in Nina's roles and accuses him of ghosting her. Turns out, though, that he's dress shopping with Gemma and he still refuses to grass up the people that he's been nicking cars from. In Nina's roles, Dee Dee is meeting up with that MND lady, I can't remember her name, Trish. In comes Billy and hangs around like a bad smell as he eavesdrops and he wants to talk about one of his parishioners. Fuck off, Billy, says Dee Dee, client uh, attorney privilege here. Right. Billy apologises and then says that he's looking for a support group. Fuck off, Billy, says Dee Dee. And Billy <laughs> finally fucks off. That was hilarious. Meanwhile, Paul approaches Damon and threatens to grass him up again. Damon says that he needs to pull in a few favours first and their meeting is interrupted by Gemma and Bernie who are keen to get going and buying a dress. Privately, Damon confirms over the phone that it's on and asks Niall to fuck Paul up good and proper. Later, Paul and Bernie are in a wedding shop. Gemma is trying on... Gemma's trying one on and reveals the plan, which is to find a dress that Gemma likes, take a photo of it, and get one of the knicker people to make a copy. She finds a dress, and Bernie's about to take a picture when the owner puts a kibosh on that. So Bernie pretends that she's about to shit herself, so the owner quickly ushers her to the staff conveniences, which allows Paul to take the photos, but then the owner comes back and catches him in the act. <clears throat> but not like that. Bernie pleads innocence, but the owner refuses to let them leave until the photos are deleted. So Paul does so and shows the owner. Satisfied, she tells them all to beat it, just as Paul gets a call from Damon when they arrange to meet for the payoff later. What do you think of Gemma's dress? I quite liked it. I thought she suited it. I didn't think it was too over the top. And no. I didn't think it was too stale. No, it was just right. She says, she says later that she's looking for something in between a nun and a slut. Right. Essentially. And I thought that was it. It was it was kind of fun. I thought, I'm not right. the best judge of what a good wedding dress yeah. looks like, but I thought it suited her. It, it seemed like it pushed up her boobage maybe a little too much. But If that's the only thing that it does. Right. Then and I you kind of should... expect a wedding dress to do that. Right. All of mine did. So Paul heads off to the precinct and is on the phone to Hlicho trying to get a hold of Gemma when Damon turns up. Damon says it sounds like he's having a bad day, so Paul explains exactly how bad his day really is and how bad his days are going to get before long and spends the next few hours unburdening himself onto Damon, who is the For only person reason. that he can really talk to about all these health and money issues. For some reason. <clears throat> and this wears Damon down, who explains that the meeting's a set-up, there is no money, and Niall and his brother are here to kick the absolute fuck out, out of Paul. Yeah, they're going to kill him. He tells Paul... Th th he never says that, and I don't know why. Because that's exactly... He implies exa it. That's exa he he implies heavily, it very strongly. He heavily implies it. I don't know like, why this is it. This is it. This is the end. This is how you die. Mm -hmm. And Paul gets it. He tells Paul to Scarper. But what about my money, says Paul. Scarper, you half-wit, says Damon. They're going to kill you. 
So Paul has been gone for a second when Niall and his brother show up and they do not like Damien's excuses that the problem has already been dealt with and no one's going to grass up no one because what, assu what assurances do they have and they want to know Paul's name and address and Damien says that he doesn't know. Later, Paul sees Damien on the street and is shocked to see that he's got a bit of jam over his left eye and some jam in his right ear and he's holding his hand a little bit. Damon doesn't want to go into details with Paul and says it's all sorted and all of this is overseen by Dee Dee. Later they bump into each other again and Paul doesn't let it go and asks what happened. Damon explains that it's all dealt with and he kept his mouth shut when they asked for Paul's address. Paul can't believe that they let him walk away and Damon says that they didn't have much choice. Which I take to mean that he kicked the fuck out of them. Yeah, which I don't know if I necessarily believe. Because those men were considerably taller than he was. And there were two of them. They looked hard. Yes. And he doesn't really... He does a bit, does I a guess. Bit. It looks I like mean, he can handle himself. There's a reason why I said Marvel should take notice and hire him to play Wolverine. Because he's short and he looks like he can fight. He looks like he can fight. He looks like he's a good scrappy guy. Yeah. Now, these were these the people that were saying... You mentioned earlier that... that questioning Damon being still still like in a gangster or hoodlum. Right, yeah. They're like, what happened to you? Why are you sticking up for this guy? You've become soft. Like you don't have balls anymore. Right, yeah. Oh, I've still got balls. Yes. I've still got big balls. Yes. You can suck on them mm -hmm. if you like. Massive balls. Mm. Yes, I will prove that I am a man by having you suck my balls. Yeah, I think I think the, the insinuation here is that he did beat the both of them up. He introduced Niall to Paul as being an absolute nutter. And his yeah. brother even more so. Right. So But that's how people have described him and Harvey. He was worse than Harvey. They have said right. that he's worse than Harvey, so maybe he is. Who knows? Paul is shocked that Damon did that for him. Damon tells him to keep it to himself and to stay away from Niall and him in future, and Paul is only too happy to confirm. In the pub, Bernie and Gemma are going through pictures of substandard wedding dresses. Gemma wants something somewhere between none and slut, and the one in the shop was perfect. They're soon joined by Paul, who has managed to salvage the photos that he took from his deleted items. Very clever. Bernie and Gemma are thrilled and make plans to get the knockoff made by a knicker person. At the bar, Dee Dee wants to know what Paul and Damon were arguing about, and she needs to know the truth. Paul promises to explain everything later at the flat. So as promised... Paul goes to see Dee Dee and he tells her about the plan to blackmail Damon, how it backfired and how he definitely won't be grassing Damon and now, now that Damon's effectively saved his life. Right. Dee Dee is about ready to wash her hands of all this. His lies and stupid plans are making it impossible for her to represent him properly and to get him off. Or so, to be his friend. So her only advice now is to, for him to plead guilty and hope for community service. And she has absolutely no idea of what the likelihood of that happening is. Right. And suddenly, finally, the penny drops for Paul. There's fuck all anyone can do to help him now. And he needs her to do something because he can't go to prison. No. And that is how we end this week's episodes. Yeah. Well, like, finally, Paul. Right. Finally. You, you've been saying this for this... a couple of weeks now. Oh, it doesn't matter. I need to get through this. It doesn't matter mm. what happened to me. Well, here you're looking at the at the sharp end of what's about to happen to you. Yeah. And it's real, and you're yeah. going to go to jail for this. Yeah. It's ridiculous that it took him this long. And I thought this was the week that I was just going to be entirely frustrated by Paul and his actions because being on bail and going to steal another car. Right. What, because it worked so well the last time? Right, yeah. Jesus. I still don't understand why we need all of this gangster car stuff. I hate it and I wish it wasn't in it. Because it's enough of a story to have this young man dying of this horrible disease. Yeah, there's a person story here that's far more interesting right, than stolen cars. Right, without the gangster shit. Right. Yeah. It's pointless and it makes me mad. Or they could have something that's a bit lower level if they're, if they're again trying to prove to us that Damon's a good guy. Right. Or a good bad guy. Right. But there are other storylines that prove that he's a good bad guy. Right. So I don't know what's going on here. Anyway. And I had, um, I had 
Dee Dee's back entirely here when mm-hmm. she's just washing her hands of the whole Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Because he's, he's doing his best to drag her down with right. him at the moment. And, yeah, and he doesn't seem to realize that. Mm-hmm. That he's putting her in a very awkward position. And I don't know why she keeps lying for him either. She said The way week, that she lies to Billy about about their movie night. She had a good line where she's talking about the number of secrets that she's holding for people because she's she has a she's secret holding keeper secrets in the for street. Sarah, yeah. Right. And Damon seems to be in amongst it all right. one way or another. But it's good yeah. that people are telling her secrets and or tell her to keep her mouth shut and she's right. and she's doing it. But but yeah, I I don't know. As far as it's concerned with um with him kind of ending up dragging Dee Dee down right. with him and not really caring about it. Well, he's just found out that he's going to die and maybe he needs some time to process it. But maybe don't use the time that you should be processing that by stealing other people's cars. Right. And dragging your friends down when you desperately need to keep your friends mm-hmm. when you're dying and you're going to need those friends' help. Yeah, that's... Um, I didn't like I didn't like her, you know, dropping that woman on him. No, that whose was awful. husband died. Yeah, that was that was a misstep on Dee Dee's part. I think it was an attempt at shock therapy. Right. And, and it didn't really work. It didn't work and it uh, it's also putting this other person who's gone through this horrible thing. Yeah, she's feeling like an in asshole in an awkward now. position. Right. But But you know what? Her husband is dead. Maybe Paul can have her husband's old wheelchair. If she still has it. See, that's the thinking that that was missing from that scene. Yeah. Andy's commode. Well, do you know what? I guess some debt all and it's fine. Right. Billy was Billy was quite annoying though. Yeah. So there's always that. But I mean, the problem with Billy being annoying is that he's being kept in the dark. Yeah. And that makes it worse. Because, like, when he comes over and interrupts them at Nina's roles, it's like, oh, finally, finally, Billy's going to find out. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't. He's thinking about his parishioner, which, thank God he's finally thinking about his work, taking his work seriously. He has parishioners. News at 10. It's something. The reason for Paul not telling Billy doesn't make a huge amount of sense no i mean i can kind of understand why he's keeping it from his sister and his mum. yes that he wants to wait until after the wedding to tell them and there's maybe part of me that says if you tell billy billy's definitely going to tell them. right billy's face is going to tell people that there's something wrong right but if that's how they find out that's right. how they find out but and he's the- got to tell somebody other than Dee Dee his and lawyer Damon. and the reason why he needs a lawyer Right. You know, I, I was kind of annoyed by Billy, too, when, when Paul broke down on the couch. Was it the couch or was it in the car? And Billy says something flippant, like, oh, I know us gays are known to be soft, but come on, buck up. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you don't even know why he's crying. Maybe you should be curious as to why he's crying. Why he's crying and why his hand still isn't getting better. Right. And yeah. He's, and he stopped talking about it. Right. Why it's getting worse instead of better. Maybe. Surely you've noticed this, Billy. Yeah, maybe there's been a development here that... You sleep with this man. How have you not noticed that his hand doesn't work? Right. Only with one hand? Well, how many hands do you need? Well, sometimes you need both. <sighs> you never need both. Sometimes you... Anyway. Sometimes you want both. Anyway. Anyway. I think... Um, I think Paul is going to have to own up here. His court case or his appearance in court feels like it must be coming up pretty soon. Right. Maybe next week. Yes. And maybe next week people start to, to learn about this. And I know that this is a long story. This, he's not going to die in a month here. Right. So th- they don't want to blow their chips straight away. Right. But dragging this out for this reason is just... Horrible. It, it makes no reason. It makes no sense it when, doesn't. when his reaction now is, "I can't go to jail." Should have been his reaction two weeks ago before right. he started stealing cars. Again. All right. Well, that was the week that was Coronation Street. I guess. Tell me, Helen, what was your moment of the week? Brian and George raising the way the rigging. 
Yeah, I think just the three of them and the... And Todd little, getting pizza. And the little Three Stooges kind of thing that they've right. got going on in the... About the, the ship building and, and Todd's cynicism about the whole thing was just right. hilarious. Yeah. Fair enough. That is our moment of the week. And we had a sad moment of the week last week, so it's good to have a happy, funny one this week. Exactly. Yes. And uh, what about your boring moment of the week? All the King Charles shite. Oh, there wasn't very much of that. <laughs> it was boring, though. Ken getting woken up from a nap. That was more boring. <laughs> All right, fine. He was lying listening to classical music, and I was like, are you all right, Ken? And then finally got woken up. I was like, whew, thank, thank good for that. Yeah, Ken's nap being interrupted by Daniel is our... Oh, there we go, we get Daniel in it. Right, That's our we get Ken and Daniel. It's too bad we couldn't squeeze Chesney in there somehow. We haven't seen much of Chesney. If you've ever been able to squeeze Chesney in somehow... <laughs> Right in to tell us about it. We're the talk of the street at gmail.com and we're at Cory Podcast on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. You can shout me and Helen a coffee by heading to ko-fi.com. That's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. Check out the clicky clicky section of boggle.co.uk for links to our merch store and YouTube channel. And if you're so inclined, please leave a rating and a review on the iTunes or your podcast provider of choice. Thanks for making it to the end of another episode. Thank you. And we will be back next week with more. Ah, talk of the street. The talk of the street. Bye. Cheerio.